Hello. I'm really excited to be here. I gave a series of lectures here about a year and a half ago on history of philosophy and um, these artists were so compliant with my heady uh, abstract ideas and they went with me and it was such a fun sort of journey from Plato all the way to Barzun in the 20th century. So this time around I wanted to do uh, a more focused uh, time period on a period of thinkers called the Inklings and for those of you that are not familiar with the Inklings this is a group of scholars that met once a week in Oxford um, started actually by an undergraduate film student Student, but it ended up including C.S. Lewis and Tolkien and Charles Williams and uh, several others that met together, um, had a beer, and shared the works that they were writing on uh, and gave each other lots of feedback, uh, critical as well as positive. And uh, then I uh, produced some of the best work, uh, Christian fantasy work of the 20th century, uh, in addition to apologetics and some other stuff. And so uh, there's this neat uh, sort of grouping of ideas that is there sort of waiting to be um, unearthed. And I did include uh, a, a few sort of non-inklings that I think I have a good argument for including them in, in the series. Uh, Chesterton and George MacDonald um, are not, uh, they were not contemporaries of Lewis and Tolkien, but both of them were highly influential in the inklings work, and we'll talk a little bit about that as the time goes. George MacDonald's also one of my favorites, so I wanted to slip him in um, sneakily, so um, you guys have been tricked into coming to MacDonald. And, um, <coughs> and then I also included Included Dorothy Sayers and, um, and well, and Charles Williams, but Dorothy Sayers, who was not allowed in the Eaglings group because she was a woman, but she was the first woman to graduate from Oxford, if I'm correct on that. Yes, so she she knew what she was doing, uh, and we'll get there. But we are going to move chronologically, which I like to do because it helps see how the ideas connect with one another. And today we're going to McDonald's kind of tricky because I think that one of the things that he says good art should do is that it should show more than it tells. Uh, that it's better to show someone a product of the imagination than to tell them 10 of your opinions about that same thing and let that thing wake in them uh, this sort of fire that um, it's, it's sort of waiting to be um, unearthed and so I kind of want to just read you my favorite passages from McDonald and let you uh, sort of gush and ooh and ah and have your imaginations be awakened. I'm gonna, so I'm going to do a little bit of that and there's a handout on your tables um, that you can follow along with um, but we're also going to talk a little bit just about what he saw the imagination to be, what he sees specifically the Christian imagination to be and how we can develop it uh, and nourish it and make it grow. And he has some interesting advice for how to teach children, but I think it actually applies to adults just as well. So um, we're going to get there. I want to move somewhat from theoretical to practical at the end uh, and definitely stop at, at some point when I get into a theoretical maze and come back down to earth. So uh, I promise we will get there. Um, I <coughs> encountered McDonald late in my life. I uh, read everything, every classic I could get my hands on in college and in grad school, but I avoided McDonald um, partially because he really isn't read as often uh, as the other Inklings are, but also because I, f I knew that he's a universalist, um, so he believes that all people will eventually end up in heaven only through Christ, but still he thinks that they will eventually all end up there. And so I just I just thought, well, that's unorthodox. I'm going to be frustrated when I read it. He's going to be sneaking it in everywhere. <clears throat> and so um, I, I just avoided it. And then my life got hard. And this is interesting because I think Lewis uh, was in a somewhat similar situation. Um, my life got hard. Uh, it got to a point where it was hard to read the text that I used to love reading, uh, to even just concentrate on them. 
and I needed a fresh new author and I someone recommended Fantasties to me and uh, I read it and it carried me through a whole season of life. Um, not only Fantasties but um, all of his works which I just kind of devoured uh, once I discovered them and um, it brought me closer to God I think um, made me choose God over anything else um, in a time of suffering um, and as a way to get through that time of suffering and uh, Lewis found him to be especially helpful in that same regard and um, I have a few quotes from Lewis uh, this is just in case you're still doubting whether a spending time at McDonald's is worth it or not um, I have some great quotes from Lewis that I think will help you be more convinced so this is on the handout he says, first, I have never concealed the fact that I regard him as my master. Indeed, I fancy I have never written a book in which I did not quote from him. And uh, C.S. Lewis says this, uh, looking back at his conversion and, <clears throat> and, and really describing MacDonald as the one that prepared his imagination uh, to, be, to be converted. Um, he then says, hardly any other writer seems to be closer or more continually close to the spirit of Christ himself. His work contains a Christ-like union of tenderness and severity. Nowhere else outside the New Testament have I found terror and comfort so intertwined. Um, and then finally, this, and this is a description of when he first read the book Fantasies, he says, but not I, but now I saw the bright shadow coming out of the book into the real world and resting there, transforming all common things and yet itself unchanged. That night my imagination was, in a certain sense, baptized. The rest of me not unnaturally took longer. So he actually encountered MacDonald when he was a teenager and it was a time in his life where he was an atheist and he was sort of um, kind of playing with romanticism and occultish uh, sorts of beliefs and <clears throat> he encountered MacDonald who affirmed a lot of the idealism of romanticism um, but uh, rejected its sort of emphasis on the self uh, as the the center from which everything emanates and um, re repositioned it on God and um, and on goodness and so um, McDonald well, Lewis thinks that McDonald sort of saved him from two uh, different routes that he could have taken uh, at that time in his life and made his imagination ready to receive the gospel when he he later does um, so I think that's a really interesting claim uh, to say that your your imagination can be baptized before you even come to believe uh, sort of acknowledge um, who Christ is and so that's one thing as an artist myself uh, and with some of the, the artists that are here I think is worth thinking about um, how through our art we can baptize our um, our viewers imagination uh, in a way that they don't even know they're doing it. They don't even know it's happening. Um, but something is changing in them that's connecting them up with reality in a, a fuller, truer, sort of um, more good kind of way. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to get into that later, but that's kind of Lewis's encounter with MacDonald. He says that he's, em he's embarrassed how few people read um, MacDonald because he's so indebted to him. And uh, he also says that MacDonald's poetry isn't so great that it's uh, kind of that it, it stumbles along um, but he later says that there's a homely quality to it that is endearing over time and that the more you read it the more you sort of fall in love with the way it stumbles along uh, in the way he writes and I I love his poetry uh, I think I think it's better than Lewis's and Tolkien's of course I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I, I highly recommend it. I think that if you enjoy prose poetry, uh, kind of a, of the type of Milton, um, Paradise Lost, that you would really enjoy um, MacDonald. So, um, going to his view of the imagination, and, um, and, and maybe just sort of briefly before that, a little bit about him. He uh, was a, Scot a Scotsman. Um, he was married. He had 11 children. 
and uh, they were all homeschooled. Uh, he wrote a lot of his books for his children, um, and were, those were later published. His children also uh, were good friends with Lewis Carroll, uh, and uh, he practiced his, his works, Alice in Wonderland and some of the others, on them. Um, and they convinced him to try to publish his stuff. Um, so he had quite the family. Um, four of his children died um, in the course of his life, and, and that hit him pretty hard. And, um, and his father, his mother died when he was eight. Um, his father later died. And all, I think, were from tuberculosis. Um, so he had a, a life full of grief in that sense. He also had a life full of grief in the sense that uh, he became a minister and because of some of his universalist views uh, was continually kicked out of uh, the Anglican churches. And um, for, for the most part, oft, was often on the brink of starvation. Uh, it was, was in such a state of poverty that he, he could barely eat. And um, I, I think it makes his writing amazing. I, I'm sad for him. I'm sad that he had to live that way, but uh, there there is this um, I'm barely making it clinging to God sort of uh, feel to his work that uh, that I think he would have maybe not had uh, had his life been any easier. So that's a little bit about him. He also he's he's like Lewis in that Lewis also lost his mom early, and and so they both uh, had a sort of yearning for a maternal uh, comfort that they didn't get. Um, but he is different from Lewis in that Lewis did not have a positive father figure, um, whereas MacDonald says that it was his father and his, uh, his father's, um, the way his father was a father to him um, that made him know God uh, and made him know that fatherhood and the love between the father and the son uh, is one of the central things that holds uh, the world together. So, um, so, so this is a slight difference. I think Lewis was somewhat envious of MacDonald um, for having uh, this connection to his father that kind of remained this ideal and, and anchor uh, that helped him through it. Um, so moving on to his own work, uh, I did actually want to start uh, us off with one of his prayers. So one of the, some of these uh, pictures that are being displayed on here, and I don't use PowerPoint ever, so I don't even know uh, if we will get to any other slides. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> depends on how I do. But um, <coughs> uh, these pictures on here were paintings that I did inspired by the passages that moved me so much when I read MacDonald uh, during those really, really hard years. And uh, I was just in the state that the only thing I could do was read the Bible, read MacDonald, and paint pictures um, about MacDonald. Uh, and all of my paintings are linked with specific passages in his books. And, um, and there was just something that uh, happened in my imagination that, that woke up when I read him that I wanted to create beauty that was connected with that. So um, this is like one of my first, I, I was never trained in painting, um, so this is my first like attempt at oil painting um, that I did a couple of years ago and I've like since developed. Um, but I kind of want us to pray this together. Can we do that? Okay, um, it, if you want to look at it on the handout, it actually is there. It is, let's see. It may be there. Maybe it's not. Is it on page two? A broken prayer. No, that one's not it. It's okay. We'll just read it from the screen if you can read it. Okay. <clears throat> o thou, what keeps the stars alight, and my soul burning with a light above that of the stars, grant that it may shine before thee, as the stars forever and ever, and as thou holds the stars burning in the night, when there's no one to see, so hold thou the light burning in my soul, when I see neither thee nor it, but am buried in the grave of sleep and forgetfulness. Grant that more and more thoughts of thy thinking may come into my heart day by day. 
until there shall be at last an open road between thee and my soul, and thy angels may ascend and descend upon me, so that I may be in thy heaven even while I am upon thy earth. Amen. So, this prayer hints at something we're about to see in some of these quotes that I want to take us through. Uh, a, a couple of things I, I want to point out. Uh, one is that it comes from a novel called uh, David Elgenbrod that is about a very um, simple man. Uh, he, he's common, he's sort of self-educated, he speaks in a Scots dialect, so this is sort of translated from the Scots dialect. And his knowledge of faith is one that has grown out of paying attention to what God does in the natural world. So, um, as, as you go through this prayer, what you see is him observing things that are happening around him in the natural world. Um, stars burning in the night, um, stars fading uh, from his view, um, a, an open road uh, between him and another thing and uh, buried in a grave of, for, of sleep and forgetfulness the way night hits upon you. And um, all of these things have taught him how to read God's messages to him, uh, to his own soul and in, in his own life. And, and so what McDonald thinks that the, the cultivation of the imagination can do is help us to look out into the world and see signs of the Father uh, that we're passing by every day uh, that, that we wouldn't notice. Um, and uh, one of the quotes that uh, we're going to get to in a second, uh, he says that the world is the human being or the human soul turned inside out. So he thinks that there's a way in which when we look around and observe the way nature works around us, the way the beauty that's created by the divine artist works around us, that we will start to begin to understand the beauty of our own souls um, and, and the spiritual sort of workings of our own souls. And uh, it sounds it sounds slightly complex. Um, and, and what I, I think that you have to see a few examples of this to, to get a hint of it. Um, and, and I want to start us off with a, um, a passage from uh, one of his really good books, Lilith. I, I'm going to say really good about all of his books. But um, Lilith, which is one of his um, more mature works. It's a fairy tale for adults, I would say. And um, there is a main character who's journeying through this new land. And in one sense, it's fairyland, so it's imaginary. But in one sense, it's more real than anything he's ever been in. Because the spiritual realities around him are truer realities than the physical ones that he was a part of. And he encounters this raven, um, this, this common bird, who is kind of his spiritual guide. And um, as he's walking along these fields around his home, the raven is pointing things out to him in nature uh, that he sort of has never um, noticed before that, that are sort of signs from God, uh, messages from God that he had never known to listen for. So I'm just going to read this part. Listen, said the raven, seeming to hold his breath. I listened and heard. Was it the sighing of a far-off musical wind or the ghost of a music that had once been glad? Or did I indeed hear anything? They go there still, said the raven. Who goes there, and where do they go? I asked. Some of the people who used to pray there go to the ruins still, he replied. But they will not go much longer, I think. What makes them go now? They need help from each other to get their thinking done, and their feelings hatched. And so they talk and sing together, and then they say the big thought floats out of their hearts like a great ship out of the river at high water. Do they pray as well as sing? No. They have found that each can best pray in his own silent heart. Some people are always at their prayers. Look, look, there goes one. He pointed right up into the air. A snow-white pigeon was mounting with quick and yet quicker wing flap the unseen spiral of an ethereal stare. The sunshine flashed quivering from its wings. I see a pigeon, I said. Of course you see a pigeon, rejoiced the raven, for there is the pigeon. I see a prayer on its way. 
I wonder now what heart is that dove's mother. Some may have come awake in my cemetery. How can a pigeon be a prayer, I said. I understand, of course, how it should be a fit symbol or likeness for one, but a live pigeon to come out of a heart? It must puzzle you. It cannot fail to do so. A prayer is a thought, a thing spiritual, I pursued. Very true, but if you understood any world besides your own, you would understand your own much better. When a heart is really alive, then it is able to think live things. There is one heart, all whose thoughts are strong, happy creatures, and whose very dreams are lives. When some pray, they lift heavy thoughts from the ground, only to drop them on it again. Others send up their prayers in living shapes, this or that, the nearest likeness to each. All live things were thoughts to begin with, and are fit therefore to be used by those that think. When one says to the great thinker, here is one of thy thoughts, I am thinking it now. That is a prayer, a word to the big heart from one of its own little hearts. Look, there is another. This time the raven pointed his beak downward to something at the foot of a block of granite. I looked and saw a little flower. I had never seen one like it before and cannot utter the feeling it woke in me by its gracious, trusting form, its color and its odor as of a new world that was yet the old. I can only say that it suggested an anemone that was of a pale rose hue and had a golden heart. That is a prayer flower, said the raven. I never saw such a flower before, I rejoined. There is no other such. Not one prayer flower is ever quite like another, he returned. How do you know it a prayer flower, I asked. By the expression of it, he answered. More than that, I cannot tell you. If you know it, you know it. If you do not, you do not. Could you not teach me to know a prayer flower when I see it, I said. I could not, but if I could, what better would you be? You would not know it of yourself and itself. Why know the name of a thing when the thing itself you do not know? Whose work is it but your own to open your eyes? But indeed the business of the universe is to make such a fool of you that you will know yourself for one and so begin to be wise. But I did see that the flower was different from any flower I had ever seen before. Therefore I knew that I must be seeing a shadow of the prayer in it. And a great awe came over me to think of the heart listening to the flower. So in this passage, there's two natural things that the raven points out to the main character. Uh, pigeons and flowers. Both the pigeons and the flowers uh, he connects somehow with seeing prayer, seeing people's prayers uh, floating up to God. And uh, the main character is, is, thinks this is sort of sweet and cute and um, a nice symbol um, to talk about, but, but nothing more, um, nothing, nothing real going on. And um, what the raven is saying is that is that every time you do see a dove flying up to heaven, uh, it, it's no doubt true that a prayer is going up to God. Uh, that, that that's just sort of one of the thousands, millions of prayers that are going up to God at that moment. And, and so in a sense, you are witnessing a spiritual reality taking place that you would be unaware of otherwise. Uh, and he says that just as a pigeon um, going up into the heavens is like a prayer going up to God, so also is a flower. Um, and, and the way that each flower is different from every other and sort of simple in its own way, um, also kind of this reminder that prayers are going on in the world and each one is, is sort of special and unique um, and individual in its own way. Um, now, when I read this book to my children, I have uh, two daughters, um, a nine-year-old, well, she just turned 10, oh, gosh, uh, a 10-year-old and an almost seven-year-old. And, and these are just two images, uh, pigeons and flowers. Uh, he, he, does, he does so much in his books with so many natural phenomena. He has um, all sorts of mythology built up around the moon. Um, he has uh, things connected to uh, boats, to the sea, to the wind and the trees. And um, my daughters and I just started to 
kind of live within these uh, these natural and spiritual connections between things. And so now, whenever we see a bird flying up, um, my little seven-year-old uh, says, um, Mommy, a prayer is going up to God right now, is going up to the great heart himself. Um, my my ten year old when she sees a flower uh, and she sees a field of flowers and and each flower being slightly different from the others but also similar, um, we've had conversations about the the unity and diversity of the church um, and and the way that our each of our own unique relationships to God is uh, just like the uniqueness of those flowers yet somehow unified and similar and all one. Uh, whenever we see the moon and you know I, I could read you the passages about the moon and they would. Um, and, and they're so powerful. Uh, Annalise says, um, "Mom, God's protecting us. Um, that the the moon is is a sign that, that God is is watching us right now. Um, he sent us. He made it so that we saw it at this very moment, so that we would know that." So, so McDonald has this way of kind of forming your imagination by re-enchanting it uh, and, and making it see and the natural things all around us, things that are actually also happening in our souls and in the way God is working with us. Um, and part of that is, is because he thinks that the imagination, which we tend to think of as a thing that we, it's, it's things that we create ourselves. Um, he, he thinks that we are, are these small microcosms um, in a giant macrocosm that is God himself and that really there is no original thought um, except in God alone. And that when our imagination is at work, what it, it's more like, it's, it's not like creating a new invention, it's more like turning a flashlight on and shining it around the world and seeing it for the first time. So he, one of the, the ways that he wants sort of our awareness of the imagination to work and even the way that we do art and develop art is actually to be, in some ways, a search for finding God. Um, a search for finding God in the way that we shine lights on the things around us that are going on. Um, nature being one of those, but the works of the imagination um, by other human beings uh, being, being others. Um, so look at this quote really quick. Um, this is on the very front of the handout. God is the origin and tell us. He says, uh, the imagination of man is made in the imagination of God. Everything of man must have been of God first, and it will help much toward our understanding of the imagination if we first succeed in regarding aright the imagination of God in which the imagination of man lives and moves and has its being. For man is rather being thought than thinking. When a new thought arises in his mind, God has made the world that it should serve his creature. The man has but to light the lamp within the form. His imagination is the light, but it is not the form. Um, these other two quotes go with it. Um, one, all growth that is not toward God is growing to decay. Um, meaning that there is a kind of growth of the imagination that if gone, if, if it is going in a direction away from God is actually not a growth but uh, a kind of fungus growth. Um, that that it's, it's, a, it's a false sort of eating away of the self that, um, that you almost have to go back that road to restart again um, and, and go toward God. The other uh, quote here he says is the one principle of hell is I am my own. So again for him rightly thinking about the Christian imagination is is never divorcing the the self and the world from its author and its creator as both the beginning and the goal and the telos of everything that we're doing. Um, and when he says that understanding the imagination of man um, has to connect with the imagination of God, he's going to be thinking of Christ primarily, of understanding the life of Christ, the teachings of Christ, the person of Christ, um, to sort of point us to what realities um, are, are real and what our imagination should sort of start stretching out towards as it, as it creates new things. Um, 
Okay, before I keep going, are there questions or comments? Okay, are you sure? This is your last chance. Okay, no, you can come, we'll come back. Um, okay, I, uh, yes, sure. Uh, what you said about the kidneys right now reminded me of something I heard one time was that um, my cousin had lost her, her mother had passed away, and within a couple of days she was washing lettuce in the sink, and there was a ladybug on the lettuce, hmm. and she thought that that was like the spirit of her mother. Hmm. To me, that was like superstitious, right. strange. Right, right. Sure. Right. Right. And actually, when I first got interested in this, I started to wonder, and, th and this is just sort of worth discussion, I think, um, where, where, does, where do you start drawing a line between um, seeing the spiritual world taking place in front of you, spiritual forms moving, being more real in certain ways than the, than the physical, and identifying a ladybug with your grandmother? Um, and 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 I uh, I think like in one sense there may not be a clear cut rule possibly uh, and, and I can see one sort of blending into the other but but I also think that the fear of of going there keeps you from going where McDonald goes which is uh, which is seeing the way prayer works um, and, and uh, one of the things that he does say. And th this may help. I'm not sure. One of the things he does say is that uh, when the imagination works, it it can change the way physical laws work, but it can't change the way moral laws work. So, uh, so you could you could create a story about a human being that flies through the air, um, and uh, or, or Rapunzel who has long hair and um, a man who climbs up her hair, but you. You can't create um, a story in which evil is good and good is evil. That that there there's actually he says that when it comes to physical laws, um, in a, in a, an imagination man can create, uh, although he still never has anything original. It, it's still all is sort of fabricated from the real. Um, but with when it comes to the moral law, all he is called to do is obey. Um, not not to create, uh, and so I, I do think that can be to a certain extent a rule that that can keep you from veering there. But um, yeah, are there thoughts on on how to how to distinguish those two ways of yeah? So the thought I was having when you were reading that passage was, you know, we go out there and we do nature and we see beautiful things, and the beauty of it, if you tie it to God. You look at it and you say to yourself, you know, Lord, thank you, you know, mm -hmm. thank you for what the sunset is. My my thirteen-year-old um, was telling me about the sunset these days and how we actually get up to see it these mm -hmm. days. So it's it's pink, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I just um, so I guess it's for me like when you're reading it, I'm thinking, okay, so beauty is something that's not tangible. Mm -hmm. it's Right. It, it's that imagination. You get what I'm saying? Like it's yes. That imagination into something sort of tangible. For right. Us in the form of he he actually. Um, it's interesting. I think that his his way of, of answering this question is similar to Augustine's hermeneutic of Scripture, uh, which is uh, he says that the best way to interpret scripture, scripture is through the lens of love. Um, love of God first and love of neighbor and, um, and, and allowing scripture to interpret itself. But he says that any meaning that arises that is consistent with the rest of scripture and leads one to love God more and love neighbor more in truth is, is a correct interpretation. Um, and so one passage doesn't have just one 
it, ha it has one, but it also could have ten. Um, that the parable of the soil and the seeds is going to have um, multiple true interpretations. There are going to be false ones, of course, when you have the lens of Scripture um, holding it against itself. But, um, but there's this way in which there's a lack of, of definiteness that allows for the layers and layers and layers of meaning that, that God intended to be there. And I think that McDonald has something similar going on in the way that we view nature. Uh, that, that we can look at a sunset and we can just think, it's beautiful, thank you God for beauty. Um, or, or see a pigeon and, and think, it's so cute. Um, or, you know, ho yeah, hopefully they're not, sometimes they're gross, but yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, look at it and, and appreciate um, certain things about it. Um, but, but there's actually sort of multiple things said about what we should learn from birds in, in the scriptures, not, not just one. And, and none of them contradict one another. Um, they all sort of line up with each other. The thing that I think McDonald's doing that's, that's deeper is that it's one thing to just see a beautiful sunset and say, that's beautiful, thank you God for this beauty. And, and that's good. It's another thing to learn about the spiritual life by, by the way nature works, which, which I think takes a, a kind of brilliant imagination to, to show. And actually, I have a really great example. Um, if you turn to, I have, two, I have two examples I want to point out. One is uh, loneliness and community from a broken prayer. This is a, this is a downer, but it's a wonderful downer. Um, he says, Oh, wilt thou hear me when I cry to thee? I am a child lost in a mighty forest. The air is thick with voices, and strange hands reach through the dusk and pluck me by the skirts. There is a voice which sounds like words from home, but as I stumble on to reach it, seems to leap from rock to rock. Oh, if it is, willing obliquity of sense, descend. Heal all my wanderings, take me by the hand, and lead me homeward through the shadows. Let me not by my willful acts of pride block up the windows of thy truth and grow a wasted, withered thing that stumbles on down to the grave with folded hands of sloth and leaden confidence. I couldn't be in a forest after reading this and it was like a new experience. Um, after reading this, I, um, I, I was in a forest and I, I was remembering and experiencing all the ways that I had felt like the journey toward God is, is like stumbling, um, stumbling over the roots um, and not being sure uh, where the sky was uh, or which direction to go, but also having the sense that, that home was around the corner. Um, and so it, wa it wasn't any more just the woods are pretty, but the woods actually are teaching me about my relationship with God. Um, so the other, the other one to look at, I, love, I have this one up in my bathroom, um, is at the bottom of, page, of that same page that I just finished on, um, where it says, From Within and Without. So this is where he takes the seasons, the four seasons of the year, and he uh, interprets spiritual meanings from them. He says, And weep not, though the beautiful decay within thy heart as daily in thine eyes. Thy heart must have its autumn, its pale skies, leading mayhap to winter's dim dismay. Yet doubt not, beauty doth not pass away. Her form departs not, though her body dies. Secure beneath the earth, the snowdrop lies, waiting the spring's young resurrection day, through the kind nurture of the winter cold. Nor seek thou by vain effort to revive the summertime when roses were alive. Do thou thy work, be willing to be old. Thy sorrow is the husk that doth enfold a gorgeous June for which thou needst not strive. So, I couldn't experience the seasons of the year the same after I read this. Uh, I, 
when I was going through summer, uh, I thought of this um, this sort of summertime when roses were alive. These are the times that God is blessing me. These are the, the times that I should be thankful and take joy in them. When autumn came and life, life got hard, um, I thought... Um, things feel like they're dying, but but maybe in the same way that uh, that things sort of hibernate in the winter. He talks about a husk of a seed that they seem like they die, but they don't. And if I was a farmer, I could explain. I, I talked to a farmer who read this poem and was like, "It's so true," and explained to me all the ways that this is a, a farming metaphor. Uh, but um, I couldn't go through an autumn again without thinking um, life, life is hard, but there's, um, that there may be a winter cold, but then um, spring's young resurrection day is coming. It's, it's on its way. Um, and, and so there's something... These, these are sprinkled throughout all of his writings. These, these sort of looking at little things in nature, and not just nature, sometimes things that his child does, things that a baby does, uh, things that a mother does when she's comforting her child. Uh, he has a lot of homely metaphors, but things that he sees happening in the physical world that point to very specific spiritual realities and, and um, sort of landscapes of the whole spiritual life. That, that aren't actually that simple, but, but are like complex and, and beautiful. Uh, and, and I would say, not just beautiful, but uh, the kind of food you need to get through hard times. Um, that, that sort of helps you walk outside and see things and know God is there. Um, that, that God is here. Yeah. It's kind of an ancient way of looking, or agricultural way of looking at the world of the pagans and the Christian mm-hmm. heritage shares, right? Mm-hmm. The, you know, the, the, I can't remember the name of the goddess, but Hesiod. Penelope or something, she goes down and spends time with Hades, mm-hmm. and Persephone, um, and then comes back, and that's a symbol of the seasons. And, right. And, you know, the Bible uses all of those natural things right. so much, and that's something very common that we mm-hmm. have probably our modernity more than our Christianity is. Has, has, yeah, I mean, I would not say I've been ever taught to, to learn from nature this way. I think I, I've been taught by my family to go to the hill country and sit in the hills and pray and be thankful for their beauty, period. Um, and, and, be, and be at peace and be happy um, and read the scriptures and see things. But uh, to, to look at a flower in, in a field of flowers and to think about the way that prayers are both one and many in the body of Christ. Um, or, or to see the way a dove flies up to the sky. And, and for that, every time I see it, to think a prayer is being sent up to God. Um, I, I haven't, my, my imagination hasn't been trained to do that well. Um, and, that, and that's kind of why when I found McDonald, I just consumed it. I just I was like, teach me. I, I want to see all these things that you're seeing. Because I, I think he did just see them. He walked around and he, and he saw them going on. Um, he says in a, a really good essay, and, and I do want to sort of... Um, I do want to talk about some of the practical implications of this. Um, he says in an essay that there are a few people that will be able to say all that they're feeling um, inside, uh, and few that will be able to do it in, in various different art forms. Um, but all of us were made to feel. Uh, and, and we were made to feel and then to start looking for the thing that woke that feeling in us. Uh, and, and really, that that search is, is the thing that leads us back to God. And, and I think that he thinks the artist's, part of the artist's role is to wake us up. Um, to, to make those feelings come alive in us and to make us start wondering where did that come from? What does that mean? What, what landscape is going on? Um, and, and how can I find the thing that I'm now longing for that I wasn't longing for before? Um, any, any other thoughts before we keep this, going? Uh, yeah. line here is going to stay with me for a long time. Be willing to be old. <laughs> <laughs> He has, um, he thinks that small tasks are harder than big tasks in the spiritual life, uh, in, in the physical spiritual life. That uh, he, he talks about his children a lot and he says that uh, they want to be great, they want to do something great. 
and so they want their dad to give them a hard task to do so that they can feel like they're serving God fully uh, and and he says well you know God speaks to every person um, you you have to listen for his voice I can't I can't be his voice for you um, and he says he says daddy I don't I don't hear his voice I only hear you talking to me uh, and and he's he's hard to hear and he says think is is there anything that you must do and he says well I haven't fed the chickens today uh, I was so excited about doing something great for God that I forgot to feed the chickens um, and he says uh, that's that's his very word that's his voice um, go go and do that and and be be his son um, be his true son and uh, the boy says well that's so small and once it's done it's it's like there's nothing there's nothing that's really been accomplished he even comes back to him six months later and says doesn't even seem like I've gotten anywhere uh, the chickens are doing okay uh, and, and, and that's about it and um, he says uh, that um, he says that the greatest one of us uh, did not care about greatness at all um, but was willing to be born in an ox's stall and to be the servant of all uh, he wasn't he wasn't thinking of greatness he was thinking of serving his father um, in heaven and um, and so he thinks that being willing to be old being willing to do these little things like feed the chickens um, wash the dishes we don't have chickens so wash the dishes fill get the gas up in the car or whatever uh, that, that these are actually harder in certain ways to do and feel like you're part of this this big spiritual vision um, that God has uh, but they're, they're sort of the perfect picture of obedience um, of, of humble obedience and so yeah be willing to be old do thou thy work they're, they're, work on that yeah, yeah, I, I, I need to work on it. I can't do everything I could do 10 years ago. Um, okay, uh, let me point out another passage where he does this neat thing that I just uh, love. Um, the way he sees spiritual realities and physical things. So turn to I Know What Beauty Is. I'm going to read it. I know what beauty is, for thou hast set the world within my heart. Its glory from me will not part. I never loved it more than now. I know the Sabbath afternoon. The light lies sleeping on the graves. Against the sky the poplar waves. The river plays a Sabbath tune. Ah, know I not the spring's snowbell? The summer woods at close of even? Autumn, when earth dies into heaven? And winter storms, I know them well. I know the rapture music brings, the power that dwells in ordered tunes, a living voice that loves and moans and speaks unutterable things. Consenting beauties in a whole, the living eye, the imperial head, the gate of inward music bred, the woman form, a radiant soul. And splendors all unspoken bide, within the ken of spirit's eye, and many a glory saileth by, born on the Godhead's living tide. But I leave all, thou man of woe, put off my shoes and come to thee. Thou art most beautiful to me, more wonderful than all I know. As child forsakes his favorite toy, his sister's sport, his wild bird's nest, and climbing to his mother's breast, enjoys yet more his former joy. I lose to find, on forehead wide, the jewels tenfold light afford. So gathered round thy glory, Lord, all beauty else is glorified. So here, he's he's doing a lot of things. Uh, he he's pointed out countless. Uh, again physical realities that point to spiritual realities he's also doing uh, this thing that he does often in his work where now he's shown you how beautiful nature is and, and how much enchantment lies there and he sort of knows that there's going to be this temptation to need an experience of those things to believe God is real and is present 
um, once you once you have these sort of gush gushy experiences of nature and of beauty, uh, and, you, and you know God is there because I felt this, uh, you almost you almost can get get addicted to uh, the need to sort of go and get a new experience, a new aesthetic experience. You can even do this with music, with visual art, um, sort of pursuing the interesting, you know, checking out a new band or whatever, um, and. He thinks that that God um, is is the ultimate gift. That the giver is the ultimate gift, um, and not the gifts that He gives. Um, and that sometimes He actually shuts the door of these beauties of our access to them, um, so that we'll go within our own hearts and find Him waiting there, um, and and behold the beautiful sort of itself um, in Him. Uh, and be reminded that, that that is actually what we're after, uh, not, not these lesser things. Um, one of the things he, do, he talks about when he's talking about teaching children to cultivate their imaginations is he says that you need to teach them to be able to move from the seen to the unseen, uh, to, to look around at things in the world and uh, be able to see what's really great about them uh, but to go from that to something invisible that's also true. And he thinks that that's sort of the makings of the ability to encounter God, uh, to encounter him in, in everything that they um, are going to sort of view in life, and to be able to think and know that the invisible thing that they can't see is more real than the visible thing they can't see. Um, and... I, so, th and this is a segue, it's, it's connected to this idea of obedience, uh, this phrase, I lose to find. So, uh, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the quote under death and resurrection, uh, what McDonald thinks is that not only is obedience and really small things something that is key to cultivating our imagination in the right way and in, in a humble way? Um, he also thinks there's this continual dying uh, that has to happen, uh, but that it has to be the right kind of dying, uh, one that gives birth to a new resurrection, and that's what he describes here. So it says, and this is a, a young boy named Curdy who's coming of age, and uh, as he's coming of age, he's, st he's not believing in miracles anymore. Uh, he's, he's sort of uh, trying to just take on a job and be a, a man. Curdy grew at this time faster in body than in mind, with the usual consequence that he was getting rather stupid. One of the chief signs of which was that he believed less and less in things he had never seen. He was becoming more and more a miner and less and less a man of the upper world where the wind blew. On his way to and from the mine, he took less and less notice of bees and butterflies, moths and dragonflies, the flowers and the brooks and the clouds. He was gradually changing into a commonplace man. There is this difference between the growth of some human beings and that of others. In the one case, it is a continuous dying, and the other a continuous resurrection. One of the latter sort comes at length to know at once whether a thing is true the moment it comes before him. One of the former class grows more and more afraid of being taken in, so afraid of it that he takes himself in altogether, and comes at length to believe in nothing but his dinner. To be sure of a thing with him is to have it between his teeth. So he has this idea um, that there is this uh, sort of continual sense of loss uh, as we prefer the giver to the gifts that he gives us, but there's also this continual coming back to life after we've died um, as we prefer to live and, and move in these unseen realities and believe that they're actually more real than the things that we can see. Um, which he thinks is tempting to lose uh, as you get older. Uh, and, and I would think, I, I, I think being a mother uh, helps me keep believing in miracles. Um, like just watching my children see the world and, uh, and believe in these, these big things. Um, the Little Prince is, is a story that sort of gets at that. Um, okay, I want to change gears to practical and have plenty of time for discussion. 
Any big questions before I go to that? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, sure. So obviously you got, got kind of sort of were able to deal with the your concerns about um, uh, McDonald as a universalist. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, yes, I will. I will. I so one of the things that I was afraid of in him um, being a universalist is uh, just not a strong enough belief in the fact that God asks us to do hard things or, or, or even does hard things that we don't understand. Uh, so a lot of more liberal interpretations of the scriptures, uh, it, it's based on not being understand why God did something, therefore God couldn't have done it or wouldn't do it. And, um, and so that, to me, um, seemed like a, a lack of faith. And if you try to live every day based on, I'm only going to believe it if I understand it, you're not going to get very far at all. Um, my children would not get very far. And, and as children of God, we, we wouldn't. Um, so I was afraid that when I encountered him, I would encounter that type of tendency, which is sort of, a, I think, a modernist tendency. Um, and the thing is, is that even though this element is in him of this uh, universalism, he has such a strong emphasis on the process of sanctification being being hard and strenuous, uh, and and not understanding why God. Uh, does the hard things that he does, but then sort of in the end believing there's a good that's coming out of it. Um, that I think that when I read him, I uh, I filter it. I, I filter it to be <coughs> sort of speaking about the believer's process of sanctification, and 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 his his statement still being kind of severe. Uh, he has a severity to him that you wouldn't expect to, to have in a universalist who says a loving God wouldn't do this or that. I mean, even to say hell is um, I am my own. Um, I, I, am, I am not his. So I actually I got on a George McDonald community discussion board and uh, the McDonald people are actually this most loving people in the world. Every time I meet them, they just, they'll, they'll just want to take their, their coat off their back and help you. Um, I mean, I had uh, one send me Christmas presents for my daughters because we couldn't afford it and she lives on the other side of the world and she barely, she just knew my artwork. Um, and, and they're all like this. But um, when I read the books, I, 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 I guess what I was Ho what I was thinking would happen is that universalism would be the thing he's trying to always get us to, um, sort of in his roundabout way, and that I would just be not impressed with that and, and, and not really want to go along with it. But he's trying to get you to Christ. And this universalism thing happens, and it's a side issue. Uh, and you can, you can embrace a lot of what he teaches and not have to go sort of all the way um, in that sense. Can I comment on that? Yeah. Um, Universalism in McDonald doesn't seem to be wrong so much in saying that uh, God is good, therefore he's going to forgive everybody, but rather saying that God is so good that it's inconceivable that people will not eventually turn to him. Um, so he's not doing away with the need of Christ or Saint just underestimating the sinfulness of a man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and then at the same time, some of his characters, like Lilith, are so dark that you think, wow, he does get how dark sin is, you know? Um, so that's a really good point. That's a really good point. I think, I think he just starts running into contradictions when, when that comes up in his text. Um, it, it, sometimes it becomes works-based, so whoever... Uh, is, is the most spiritually um, sort of active, that's the person that's going to get to God first, and then it still is, there's a problem there. Um, so, yeah. Yes? On the other hand, uh, the, uh, the problem that exists in Augustine all these guys is the problem of faith, <coughs> and it's, in a sense, uh, faith presents the same intellectual problem mm -hmm. grace produces the same intellectual problems as the universe. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I became acquainted with uh, 
with McDonald when I did my thesis on C.S. Lewis, and uh, but I didn't really start reading until I met you. <laughs> and uh, I became a member of these universalist things. Mm -hmm. But uh, in in my church, for instance, there there are two ways of looking at uh, damnation. One is the old hellfire and damnation thing, you know, and the other is the is the uh, uh, mortality of the soul, that is, death. And Lewis seems to be kind of in between. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, but uh, you might be interested to know that uh, one of my good personal friends died last month, and I had a long talk with him a couple of years ago. He, he was a singer. Dr. Ralph Stanley. Oh yeah, I love Ralph Stanley. Yeah, well, Ralph Stanley was a friend of mine, and he wow. we had a long talk one time, and he found out that I was a uh, religion teacher, so he immediately went to religion. And uh, he told me that he was a <coughs> Universalist Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> and I had never heard of such things. <laughs> And I, so I told him, well, I'm almost a universalist candlelight. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, that, that has sent me thinking mm -hmm. quite a bit, too, on uh, universalism. Because universalism is not an easy route. Mm -hmm. uh, Lewis has to even put in a kind of a, a purgatory. Right, right. So universalism is not an easy route, but it... Uh, it is also not inconsistent with uh, with the high view of God. Mm -hmm. He, I, I agree. Uh, that's what I didn't know was possible. I didn't know it was possible for someone to be a universalist and still have a very high view of God. Uh, and and um, I think there's something in McDonald where he thinks that the fear of hell. It, is, is certainly a, uh, a thing that can motivate you, uh, but that running away from God, even in this life, is already a bad idea. Uh, and, and so, um, in, in certain ways, ev even in this life, running away from God is, is sure to put you in a kind of hell um, here on earth, internally, uh, to a certain extent, so much so that y you almost shouldn't need any argument beyond that. Um, that it's almost the same argument that Plato makes in the Republic uh, for justice. That uh, even if th you are able to get away with doing the wrong thing uh, and being a tyrant and seeming to be just when you really are not, your soul is in such a state of disorder that you're the most miserable person on earth. And so I think that I think that McDonald says that uh, you almost you almost don't even need to go there as far as the eternal um, damnation because it's already so bad to think of uh, not running towards Christ right now. Um, I'm, I'm not a universalist so I still end up disagreeing with him but I, I do sort of appreciate um, the, way, the way he sort of emphasizes that aspect. The last survey that I saw that George Barner did was about 20 years ago. So that 84% of the people in churches at that time mm -hmm. were universalists. <laughs> wow. Unitarian or, or Christian? Christian well, yeah, yeah. Interesting. And what I was wondering is how does he put the flesh on this skeleton of universalism with the fact that you still have to come to Christ? Is it because God is love that he could not send anybody to hell? I, th I think, I think there's I'm not as I sort of avoid this part of his of his writing. So I'm not. I, I mean, the sermons that emphasize this really strongly, I I've like skimmed. Um, I, I've read to a certain extent, so I don't feel like I can give a really good answer. But uh, he thinks that there is a kind of um, there's a kind of purgation that happens in um, the state of the soul that is suffering because they're apart from they're apart from God that that you could sort of it's it's like the child who uh, is 
upset with his parents he wants to do his own thing he goes to his room and he sits there and he's just determined to wait it out like my my older daughter she she was kind of this way uh in her terrible twos she didn't want to say she was sorry she didn't want me to even think that she felt bad about it she just wanted to wait it out as long as possible if you know my daughter you know this is she's capable of this um and yeah yeah no no we do we do and um uh, but but like there was this point where she was so miserable uh waiting and uh and and, and like in, in in it was like she said i love my room uh, thanks for sending me to my room mom you know i'm gonna have a great time in here she really did and uh <laughs> And so, you know, she plays in her room for a while, but eventually she misses me, um, and she's miserable. Um, and and so this through through suffering and being apart from me, um, there's this like point at which it's actually just not as as preferable to to returning. Um, and I think that possibly he thinks that uh, there's this way in which you give like an infinite amount of time and, and this could happen to anyone. Um, the universalists also believe that you were saved through Jesus Christ. Right. Otherwise, uh, Abraham, who never heard of Jesus Christ, couldn't be saved, or any of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, so, so being saved through Jesus Christ does not necessarily include ever, heard, ever having heard of him. I definitely... I definitely didn't realize how immense the distinction is between a Unitarian Universalist who thinks that there all there's all sorts of different ways to get saved, um, and everyone has their own way, and all of them are going to work, and a Christian Universalist who thinks eventually everyone will get saved, but the only way is through Christ. Uh, and, and there's a really, really big difference between those those two worldviews, and so to call them both Universalist, I think that that does in certain ways make McDonald's somewhat misunderstood, um, if that makes sense. Will it receive images as he travels through this like very land of like the people who have died slowly be regenerated, mm -hmm. slowly learning to, so it seems to be very much like the idea of this purgatory or something mm -hmm. that um, eventually through a long process of being separated from God or largely separated from God, people will uh, so human souls will eventually come to see him mm -hmm. their own isolation. I'm still very heavily involved in interfaith dialogue, particularly mm -hmm. with Muslims. And uh, those of you who are Baptists may get a kick out of the fact that uh, the Campbells who established the Churches of Christ, and they didn't establish them, but they were some of the forerunners. Um, were actually kicked out of the Baptist Church for believing too many people were going to be saved. <laughs> and uh, most people who know anything about the Church of Christ today think it's kind of the opposite because they only know about the Church of Christ since the 50s. <laughs> well, I have never been a 50s church. <laughs> uh, but anyway, and so after I got involved in this uh, interfaith dialogue, I realized that Campbell makes a, uh, in a very important letter he wrote, called the letter to the Lunenburg Lady, letter, lady. He had written something in the Christian Baptist about how that um, he believed that baptism is the proper order, I mean, immersion is the proper order, but that uh, you don't have to be immersed to be, to be saved, to go to heaven. Right. Um, if that were true, he said, then the Presbyterians couldn't go to heaven, and the uh, Catholics could not go to heaven. And the Muslims couldn't go there. And I didn't even read that. And the, th and the thief on the cross. Um, yes. the, the thief on the cross. And, uh, and so I, I didn't even read that until I got involved in, uh, in interfaith dialogue. So it's... Uh, there, there, there's a lot of universalist haze out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, the conversation is, is worth having. Um, and, and if anything... McDonald raises those questions, and, and they're questions we should ask ourselves and, um, and, and be able to converse about, um, be able to sort of think through. So um, 
I want to say a few things. Uh, I'm really only I really only want to spend maybe five minutes on this, and then I want to open it up um, to you all as far as practical implications go. Uh, so at the end of this one essay that McDonald has, it's called um, it's it's about the imagination. He is talking about. He's basically asking um, if, if this is what if we do agree imagination is a good thing, if we do believe there's a Christian imagination, then what can we do to cultivate an imagination like that? Uh, and I, I think he's actually even thinking as as a father about his children, uh, about about how to sort of raise them in a way that nourishes that. And uh, and so after a very theoretical essay, he he goes into sort of a philosophy of education, uh, and he gets he gets very practical. Um, so a, a couple of the things that he says I think are really are, are great. So first of all, he quotes Goethe, um, who says that we should surround ourselves with beauty every day. Uh, that if, if we want our imagination to be cultivated, then we should um, find the things that have been created by great imaginations and put those in our view. Um, whether it's a really great poem, where, whether it's um, nature, whether it's uh, a, a piece of visual art or a book, that there's something about, um, and, and for children especially, there's something about uh, letting their, their minds and their hearts and their souls be nourished on this kind of food uh, every single day. Um, he sa- and he says, interestingly, the cultivation of the imagination is about food and exercise. Um, and so one of, one of the foods of the imagination is just this idea that Goethe has of surrounding it with things that are the most beautiful. Um, he says even teaching the child to distinguish not just between good and evil, but between good and not so good. So, so there's a lot of things that are sort of mediocre good, and, um, and so they're not evil. I mean, video games might be in this category. Um, there's a lot of books. That the li- Whenever I take my daughters to the library, I would say 90% of the books on the shelf for the kids are in this not-so-good, mediocre category. Um, and then about 10% of them, maybe less, are actually high-quality literature. Uh, that's a problem with modern libraries, I guess. But actually, he comments on it even in his own day. But um, So teaching them to sort of just believe there, there's so much truly good stuff out there that it's not worth spending the majority of your time on the medium good. Um, The other thing he says, and this is interesting, and I kind of wanted to see what the visual artists in here think, uh, because my experience with visual artists is that they aren't always big readers. Um, Sometimes they are, um, but there's something about uh, doing with, with the hands that is um, much more intuitive and, and tacit and, and reading a book um, feels almost like um, isolating. Uh, there's a, something that you're cutting off from yourself that you can't use. And um, McDonald thinks, though, that uh, Goethe's advice is somewhat in danger if books aren't one of the primary types of food that your imagination gets. Uh, and, and so he, he thinks that, especially children, um, yes, give them classical music, yes, give them good visual art, um, yes, give them all these things, but there's something about giving them, um, you know, Gulliver's Travels and, John, and um, you know, uh, Robinson Crusoe and these books that, and, and I think part of the reason is that all of them are taking the scene and doing something with the unseen. And so they're, ta- they're making that, that move from seen to unseen, and you're watching it on display over and over and over and over again. Um, and so he thinks that a pro- proper diet for the imagination has to involve um, book learning as well as the other uh, visual arts um, and, and music. Um, what, do, what do you guys think of that? He didn't have interest. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he also says, so this is connected to that. He also thinks, he thinks skimming is one of the worst, uh, he, he, he thinks speed reading and skimming is one of the worst um, maladies of, of his, his culture. Um, that he says, if a book is worth reading, it's not worth skimming. 
And if it is only worth skimming, it's not worth reading. Except, he says, by maybe the very best scholar who just needs to know what this other scholar thinks about this. But, yeah. Yeah, he says he says that uh, a lot of the people he knows uh, speed through um, all of the the latest literature. They keep up with their you know their version of Twitter, their version of the latest articles that have come out, and um, and speed through those. But the sitting down and working slowly through War and Peace, something like that, um, they don't know how to do it. Yeah. Yeah, Adler. It's fantastic. Yes, I love it. There's actually a, an, another book. So I highly recommend how to read a book. I also highly recommend a book called uh, How to Read Slowly. Uh, and it, it came out when speed reading classes became like the big buzz, like you sign your kid up for speed reading so they can do well in school. And uh, this man, James Sire, who I've met, he's actually just a really awesome person, human being, um, wrote a book called How to Read Slowly uh, and, and argues in that um, for developing this ability to, to take your time um, and, and choosing only books to read that you will take your time in going through. Um, and just not not really thinking about picking the ones up that you would speed read anyway. So so Pinterest, like I wonder, is, is Pinterest a kind of skimming for the visual artist? The, the, the primary difference um, the, uh, that I see with, um, so you're basically talking about what is your jumping off point. Um, so with you know, Robinson Crusoe, you fill in the imagery you're sort of giving the, you're putting pictures to the words. Mm -hmm. um, for a, a visual artist, so with a picture, you may, you may have 30 pages of data or more contained in one picture. Um, and so it's a very it's a very dense way of transmitting meaning and, and information. Mm -hmm. um, but I think to a visual artist in the same way that you, know, you, you have read McDonald and then you had to paint. Mm -hmm. um, right. The... The, but you, knowing you, I think you're a primary reader, sort of written word. Mm -hmm. the, the, and then that loss, you know, the, the, that's where your thoughts jump off from. Um, but the, being a visual person, I think you can get the same thing from a, you get that same sort of infectious mm -hmm. creativity mm -hmm. from some other, someone else's uh, the creation of beauty. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see that. Um, I, w I wonder if it's his predilection for words and, and the power of words that that makes him believe that there's something that all of us need from them. Um, of course, you know, Christ is the word. The, I mean, the Bible was written in words and not in a um, sonata uh, and, and not in a painting. Um, and, and that in itself is interesting. Um, yeah? I'm not a visual artist, but maybe Pinterest is like scanning the titles of something. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, so you're yeah. looking for a certain idea, and mm -hmm. then you land on it, and then you kind of focus on. It. Right, right. I mean, I think uh, one of the arguments he makes is that it's just hard to, and this would have been maybe more true in his day than it is now. Hard to encounter, have a real encounter with a piece of um, music or a piece of visual art, um, whereas it's very easy to get a copy of Robinson Crusoe. So now you can get on Pinterest and pull up Monet or or whoever, um, even if you are in the lowest socioeconomic bracket. Um, it still is like deceptively not the same as looking at Monet in a museum for an hour. And, and you kind of can forget that that's, that's true. You know, that first question you asked mm -hmm. is Yeah, I think part of the problem starts with our education system. You know, colleges now, they train people for a particular job. Mm -hmm. Liberal arts have declined uh, over the years. If you look back to the 20s in Paris, Picasso, all his friends were poets. Mm -hmm. Or look at the Impressions, and guys like Emile Zola, uh, they were all friends, and they, they sat and talked about ideas. Everybody's in isolation now. Mm -hmm. We don't get together. With or you at least have to run a little bit against the green, um, I think. 
uh, I mean, we're trying to remedy that uh, at, at Trinity with, uh, it's definitely a liberal arts approach, but I think our kids, when they talk to other kids that are going to public school, they realize they're getting something very, very, very different um, than what their friends are getting. And <laughs> yeah, and I'm thankful for that. Um, but but it also uh, it is hard sometimes to convince people that it's worth it. Um, they they want to know how many AP tests can you can you pass? Um, what's your GRE score? Um, our kids do well on those, but it does. That's that's actually not what they're what they're trying for. Um, I mean, my sixth graders are reading Shakespeare and, and loving it. Um, they're reading Beowulf in the bathroom so they can hear their voices echo and weeping. Um, so it, some of them, some of them are weeping with their mothers. I mean, uh, so, so, you know, that, that, that's awesome. Like that, that's what we want, you know, and even if they become a plumber like that, we still want them to have had that experience because like it, McDonald says, it awakes feeling in them that leads them back to God, I think. Well, and even in the artistic community, I think that I feel the drive that you want to write poetry, you may be inclined to write poetry, but you want to publish it, you want to make a living as a poet. Mm -hmm. poet. So, yeah, you may be artistic, but you want to make that your job. Mm -hmm. And I, I sense that the older communities, they were writing it because they were sharing it with the community. And I'm sure many of them were starving and wanted to get paid for it, but also that there was this other drive, mm -hmm. not just to publish your parish, not just to make a go of it, but to write it because they wanted to write it. Mm -hmm. That was enough. It's true. Yeah. The art is a... I, I love the fact that I'm doing... I, I'm not having to make any money for my art anymore. Um, the times when I did... I did create more, but uh, there is something very freeing about just, I want to paint this. Uh, and who knows if it will sell or sit in my room for the rest of my life. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. When that motivation is there, it changes. Um, I kind of want want to hear from the visual artists as far as just, and we only have a couple more minutes, but just as far as this idea of through a, a painting, um, teaching someone to do what McDonald, I showed you McDonald doing with the pigeons um, and with the flowers. Um, and, and he does this, you know, with the moon and with some other things, with the seasons. Um, do visual artists have the ability to train the imagination in that same way? Yeah. Well, I think um, a lot of what we're getting at maybe is our preconceived notions and our assumptions about things and how mm -hmm. we build them. reading this, I don't feel as crazy as I did before, <laughs> because I, I just I think a lot about my place in the universe and why I'm here, and uh, I'm trying to make sense of it all, in a way, you know, mm -hmm. the more that we think of how amazing God made everything, and the more we dig in, then we kind of do refresh that feeling of that this is not preconceived. Mm -hmm. not used to this, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I found it very comforting. Hmm. It's interesting because that that idea of feeling comforted, uh, of not being alone anymore, yeah. uh, that that's one of the main feelings I feel when I read McDonald. Um, not, not alone anymore in the world. Um, well, there's something like when I'm thinking about universe and I know that it can't look at itself but in a way it is through my eyes mm -hmm. but I'm not in that and I know that is not inanimate mm -hmm. I know that's for real I know that is um, not an echo but a reply mm -hmm. so I know I'm not alone and I think if, as a visual artist if we can try to push the, the preconceived notions out of the way mm -hmm. it, that more than I think that's possible. Hmm. I think as a visual artist, part of what I'm trying to do is help people see something they may see every day differently. Yes. Um, and, you know, look beyond face value further into it. And mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing that yeah. McDonald is, is saying to do is, you know, you yeah. see these things every day. 
think about it a little bit more. Mm -hmm. That's what we do visually. I think people, some people <coughs> will get more out of reading a paragraph, mm -hmm. and some people will get more out of looking at something. At, like a Georgia O'Keeffe picture of a flower. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I'm very visual. Mm -hmm. You want me to remember something, put it up on the board. Right. You know, so I can actually look at it. Right. Then I'll remember. And mm -hmm. so as a visual artist, that's, that's partly my way of communicating. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think that this is a silly thing, sort of, but I think that the uh, picture of a girl reading a book is one of the most beautiful things in reality ever. And so I draw pictures of girls reading books um, all the time. And, and I, I want, when someone sees a girl reading a book, them to think, that's a beautiful thing that I'm looking at. There's something like really magical going on. Um, there's like a whole spiritual universe going on there. Um, and, and I think that I'm like trying to get people to notice, but I don't, I didn't ever realize that until now. Um, so I didn't have, no, I had an agenda. Um, <laughs> I guess I do. But it's like, it's like training in the art of noticing. Yeah. Well, the pictures of your own girls reading books. Yes. Yes. I, I, uh, they, they, that's okay. So the two ways that I can draw them are when they sleep or when they read books because those are the only times they're still. Um, <laughs> otherwise, they're moving around everywhere. But I, yeah, I, I have no idea how many pictures I've drawn of Claire and Annalise reading books. Um, a lot. And I love it. I love it. There's something spiritual there. <laughs> <laughs>